Why do we need past life memories? The techniques available to a modern man. The teacher of the club Om Datru, Andrei Verba. Friends, today we will talk about past lives. We will answer such questions as Why do we need it and do we need it at all? Who needs it and who doesn't need it? And what is it? But in order to talk on the subject, I think we should listen to your points of view. What is a past life from your point of view? How do you understand it? Who can express his or her opinion? What is a past life from your point of view? Do you have anything to say? It's the experience that we have accumulated in a past life. Well, do you have any other points of view? It's a specific material body in which we were before this material body. Okay, any other opinions? It's a set of qualities. Okay, past life is a set of qualities. It's the experience that we have gained. Today you slept at night. Did you have a dream? Please, raise your hands who had a dream. We woke up this morning and we have a new life. It seems that some events happened there, but when you opened your eyes in your bed, you began a new life. You remembered what behavior patterns you had, what you can do and what you mustn't do. So you moved in accordance with certain parameters. But you had a dream. And in the dream people often behave quite consciously, do something and even gain some experience to some extent. If you consider it principally, Every waking up is a new life. The only difference between the past life, which may have been before this physical body in this world, and your morning is that this is a global transition from one level to another. So, in the dream you were gaining some experience and now you gain the other experience that is more essential. But in fact, you begin almost a new life every day. You shared the concepts of your view on this question. They were correct to some extent. But if you consider the version of the experience that you have accumulated in the past life, in fact, your personality is irrelevant to a past life of Jivatma at all. So, you as a personality that grew in this world have no past life. You are a formed product of this society. So, your personality was formed under the influence of an incoming information from the environment where you were. If you had been in the other environment with other beliefs, you would have had a different personality. That's why some people say that there are no past lives. They are right to some extent. They as personalities don't have past life. Those people who have a soul to some extent have past lives. Depending on the actions the soul made in the past, to such extent we can say that it had some past lives. If the soul is so young or has such qualities that it begins almost from scratch, such souls can't speak about past lives at all. So, here we have come to the important points. I have mentioned several times the word soul. What is your point of view? It's the basis that is outside time and space. It's above mind, consciousness and ego. It's the God particle, which passes from one body to another for the accumulation of wisdom, experience and uh, knowledge, so in order to develop. I disagree. Do you have any other points of view? One's consciousness, something general divided into particles, I mean individual consciousness, this is Jivatma. But the soul is one thing and Jivatma is another thing. The question was about the soul. 
It's a part of the creator which monitors other particles of the creator from the other point of view. They were united in one, but now they are divided. You have all rolled into one. You are right, but you are talking not about the soul, but about Jivatma. The particle which you speak about is Jivatma. The soul is something that grows around Jivatma. If you look at it primitively, this is the dot you spoke about. You said that once there was universal Atman that was divided for the accumulation of experience. There is such a theory which explains why there is such a variety of living beings. So, once there was only one Jivatma, but in order to gain different experience, Jivatma started dividing. This is the same when you want to go left to see what's around the corner and to go right to see what's there, but you can't tear yourself apart. However, at certain stage and under certain conditions, Jivatma can split up and begin to accumulate two experiences simultaneously. And according to this theory, there is such an explanation that all of us who are born in this galaxy are the parts of a single whole. Because once we begin to accumulate experience from different perspectives in order to have a comprehensive view and to be able to consider possible variants of the cause of events. According to this theory, there is a point of view that once all the Jivatmas will get together and become a single whole again, but they have already gained all possible experience. That's why what is called Jivatma in different sources is the part that is beyond time and space, not vulnerable to destruction and so on. So they change the phrases, so we in various space. A specific layer is formed on this Jivatma, and it's called the soul. But the soul exists only if a person overcomes such limitations and evolves. The soul means moral and spiritual feats. If a person performs moral and spiritual feats, he or she nurtures the soul. If, on the contrary, a person shows the low qualities, he neutralizes the soul. Here we have come to another important concept. Why are there people with a soul and people without a soul? We call such a man a soulless person, and most likely everyone will understand correctly whom we are talking about. What is a soulless person from your point of view? This is a person who is uh, unconscionable, cruel. Okay, if we list it, positive qualities will be here and negative qualities of a soulless person will be there. So, you see, the word soulless means some negative qualities of a person which can be manifested outwards. Do you agree with it? It's not usually written about it, but the life has taught you to understand this concept. Such a person can make any awful thing or a vile act. So, why do such souls exist? Two variants are possible. As for the first one, this is a very immature soul because of rebirth. There is such a theory that some souls on this planet are reborn even from top to bottom. So, again, some experience for the first time. If you have ever watched children, probably noticed that a child can do, to put it mildly, not the nicest things, but he does it sincerely, without a second thought, not realizing what he really does, and he does something wrong. Do you understand what I mean? He can hurt someone or cause some problems, and he doesn't even think that uh, it can hurt someone. He doesn't have such concepts. 
Similarly, there are the souls or other jivatmas who have not formed the concept of good and evil yet. They accumulate their first experience. So, we can say about them that they are the young souls who are moving from top to bottom. There is another category of souls that have done a lot of nasty things in their previous lives and have become addicted to bad deeds. Again, you can look at your life experience. Surely you know that there are people who do evil. So, the man who does evil even understands it sometimes and probably takes pleasure in his actions. And he doesn't think about the fact that it's bad. It's perfectly normal for him to do some unfair things to someone. Tell me, please, who has ever faced people who do evil? Please, raise your hands. So, you assume that there are such people who do things that seem very strange to others, but they allow themselves to do it somehow. That's why, if such a man lives for a long time and accumulates a lot of negative qualities, the experience of this soul is so vicious that the tendency is to do bad things remain when such a man reincarnates. Please, understand it. This is an important fundamental thing. If, living in this world, a person develops the habit of doing bad things, and if he is reborn, he will do bad things in the same way, out of habit in the future. He will follow this well-trodden path. That's why there are special institutions for such souls. They are called purgatories in the scriptures. This is a special place where the soul is placed and where it experiences a certain amount of problems in order to eliminate all its negative experience. If you have faced computer equipment, probably you know there is a concept formatting. In order to completely delete the information stored on the hard disk, the disk is formatted. The information isn't just deleted, a new layout in the sectors of the hard drive is made. There is almost the same thing in purgatory. They completely reset their personality to eliminate all the negative qualities such as meanness, evil, and so on, so that the soul won't take the path which it follows life after life. Okay. Do you have any questions or maybe comments to this introductory part? Do you understand what we are talking about? Okay, let's move on. After how many lives the soul is placed in purgatory? Does it happen immediately or does the soul have another chance? I think it depends on the degree of the nasty things the soul can do. If the degree is high, probably it happens very fast. But if you look at the process of reincarnation, you may notice that the degradation process is slow. Similarly, the evolution process is slow, too. The soul degrades gradually. Today, a person has done few nasty things. In the next life, he does more and and so on, the quantity will increase. People who cause problems for others are quite strange people. They aren't quite adequate, to put it mildly. So these are the people who look at their reality in a rather strange way. So we have come to a very important issue. Yes? Is it possible that later in the new incarnation this soul will want to accumulate negative experience again? Yes, of course, that's why it's so problematic to get off samsara. Even if the soul is cleansed, a very long process starts according to the scriptures. So it's said that even if the soul is cleansed, it has to gain the whole life experience from scratch. It's written that the evolution system begins with the stone. The soul was cleansed, it is reborn. 
carbon as a stone and is stained stone for a very long time. Then it evolves to the level of plant. Then from the level of plant to the level of animal, then from the animal level it can evolve to the level of human, then from the human level to the level of others, then it can go to the heaven and to become deity. But depending on how writers think the soul will do, it will go up this ladder. So, there is an important point. The soul extends due to the writer's actions, and at the same time it doesn't spoil. The word spoil isn't suitable. Do we have any other words in our language to say that the soul has become worse? Yes, it degrades. Maybe something else? Yes, it becomes chaos. We can say a chaos soul, you are right. Do we have any other words? Yes, it can shallow. You are perfectly right. Surely you can find something else in our language. It becomes exhausted. Yes. The rot appeared, maybe. Yes, they say so. Therefore, a certain system of actions determines what the outcome will be at the end of the life of the soul. This is why the saints achieve holiness through spiritual feats. There is such a concept. For example, a difficult situation appears in front of a person. One can turn tail and run away. The other person will say, no, I won't do this. I'll do my best to contend for truth. So, a person creates a certain precedent. He overcomes greed, selfishness and fear. So, the soul must get frightened to overcome its habitual forms and to do a certain feat. And this feat means the extension of the qualities of the soul. That's why so few saints appear. It's because most people facing this or that situation act just out of habit. Right? So, what I'm getting at? If Jivatma had made a large amount of negativity, it may encounter very dramatic conditions in its future lives, and it will feel bad. If doing this, it comes to the hell, it will be renewed and it will have to climb up and to evolve again. But this soul will be young. It will have not the best qualities. This soul won't be capable of sacrifice, for example. It will have just primitive materialism, and there are a lot of such souls in the modern world. These are the souls who think only about themselves and do not the best things, and so on. Let's go back to the very beginning. You talked about a particle as a soul, that is called Jivatma. Jivatma is what that accumulates experience. And all the rest is the miscellaneous theater that is called life where Jivatma can prove itself in many different ways and different behavior patterns. And you as a personality are just indirectly related to the soul. So, what is found around the soul, if a man has it, is personality and consciousness, which you understand as I. When you are talking about yourself, you are talking about this substance, which was formed around the soul. If, for example, the Jivatma has no soul, a man lives as a covert or a rascal, so he is a soul as a callous, as you said. So, his consciousness will be the same. Such a person can easily do some nasty things. From this point of view, it's usually said that there is no karma at the level of Jivatma. Karma exists for the soul. Karma is formed and exists at the level of the soul, because if Jivatma 
lives being out of control at all. Imagine that we live in a society where everything is allowed, you can do everything without any consequences. I assure you that it will be not the best society, because surely there will be someone who will tell, but I need more than others. In one sutra, Buddha explained to his disciples how past life memories happen. This is a classic Buddhist experience. When a person starts the path of self-discovery, he begins to rewind the events of his life in chronological order like a kaleidoscope. He begins to see the cause of events, but it's possible only if you are keeping your consciousness on sight for a long time. When you aren't receiving the external information for a long time, and you begin to look inside. So, the so-called unwinding starts. According to Patanjali Sudras, translated by Valley, it said that if you want to remember your past lives, you must develop and strengthen your concentration, so that you will not dissipate your attention on different things, but concentrate on one object within yourself and to go inside through your inner world. I've read such a thing in one book. The fastest way to know God means not to look at the sky or the stars, but at your inner world. This is the shortest way because all living beings, including deities that live in this galaxy, are connected through the inner world, through Jivatma. For example, if you concentrate on your Jivatma, this is the fastest way to reach the level of Jivatma of some deity, for example. But in fact, judging by the experience which we will get on our retreats, they usually remember what is necessary for their development. Most often, a person asks himself a specific question. So, this person has come to retreat to find the answer to this specific question. Some people do it consciously. Most people have personal questions, for example, he or she has to solve some problems in their family or to take a decision on marriage, for example. Most often, the person gets the experience that he or she wants to get, but the soul isn't so interested in personality. Yes, probably, but the soul has a very strong leverage on the personality. The soul can influence the personality so that the personality will be interested in certain qualities. So, the soul or something that is deeper than the soul can give motivations. The person will be interested in it. But what the result the person will have is an open issue. But in fact, when some time ago we conducted so, the retreat's different sounds. Every fifth participant remembered past life during 10 days of the retreat. Now this figure has reached 40%. Perhaps it happened because we perfected the technology or probably the quality of participants increased. The guys who are going do it more consciously, so they realize their aim. They come here not for show, but to make efforts. After all, retreat means patience and good preparation, so people have to prepare for treat at home significantly so that they will come and be ready for it. When a person comes just to try and there is no matter for him whether he will succeed or not, the result will be the same, but in fact about 40% of guys have subtle experience, and it's important to some extent. Well, do you have any questions? So, today there are several ways to see past lives in this world. Sometimes it happens spontaneously when a person has an insight and suddenly begins to realize something. Sometimes it happens in a dream and a person begins to realize why he has this problem. For example, Bob and John have a problem, and Bob can't understand why it happens. Then he has an insight and he remembers what he did wrong in his previous lives and why this man is trying to get back at him. But such examples are rare. 
The second way that is often used is regressive hypnosis. When they try by hypnosis to lead a person to the inner level where he begins to flip through the events of the past, but it happens with the help of another person. How is this person called? We can't call him hypnotist. Yes, you are right. He is a mediator. So, a mediator leads this person. But personally, I am always skeptical about it because I watched the cases of regressive hypnosis and I know what we will get with the help of regressive hypnosis. That is why I have doubts that the mediator who puts a person in the state of hypnosis is not interested in the experience. In this case, the negative aspect is that the personality of the hypnotist may affect the experience that a person can get. That's why it is uncertain whether it is real. There are some doubts about it. But nevertheless, if there is a person who has some problems and he urgently needs to deal with his or her past lives, Maybe it's a matter of life and death with aggressive hypnosis. It's just necessary for this category of people. Or it's necessary for those yogis who have a little desire and after it they begin to develop. In many cases, it's better than nothing. In the next stage, there are the techniques that allow you to discover it through your own practice. This is so-called retreat. Different schools suggest different retreats. They differ from each other very much. It's hard to say where it came from. If you read scriptures, you can find out that some time ago people who remembered their past lives were born. Now there are much less such people. However, if if I'm not mistaken, Raymond Moody has conducted a research on this subject. On our website, Om.ru, in the section of Reincarnation, you can find the publication about the scientist Raymond Moody. They conducted the following research during 30 years. They were looking for the children who told their parents that they remembered their past lives. Of course, it's easy to take their word for it, but these scientists checked it. They recorded everything that the child said and then investigated those facts. They checked if there was such a town, street and house which the children told about. And they found a lot of proofs. I don't remember the exact statistical data, but as a result, within 30 years, they found more than 1,000 cases, which proved that those children told the truth. I don't remember the exact figure, maybe there were about 1,500 or 1,700 cases, but more than 1,000 cases for sure. But in fact, there are the techniques that that allow the person to dive into his inner world. What are these techniques? There are two main schools. As for Vipassana, or as it's called Vipassana, there is a system of Kayenka, which is rather widespread in Europe and the United States. And there is also the system of Mahasi Sayada, which is more oriental. It's widespread in Thailand, Sri Lanka, Burma, and so on. These techniques differ from each other very much. Vipassana by Gayenka means mostly sitting. So, you come to some place, pay as much as you want. They are doing great. They are altruistic. They conduct it for donations and provide people with everything they need. And, of course, we have a lot to learn from them. Unfortunately, we can't do that so living in the forest. Here it's very expensive for us. So, the person is uh, mostly sitting there for 10 days, 10 days concentrating on certain inequalities and on things that the master says. It is hard enough. Imagine sitting 10 days, about 10 hours per day. 
Not everyone can afford it. At least you need to be able just to sit. If you have ever tried to sit more than two or three hours, you realize that you start fidgeting and wiggling. But in this moment, you need to concentrate on your inner world and try to remember your past lives despite all the pain and discomfort in the legs and in the back. How do people manage it? I highly doubt that it's possible. That's why there's an alternative which is diametrically opposed. This is the system of Mahasya Siyado. According to it, the participants have a lot of dynamic practices, but they don't sleep at night. They're trying to do certain consistent practices day and night. They alternate statics and dynamics. For example, they are working for two hours and sitting for two hours, and then they are working for two hours and sitting for two hours again. And they spend all the days and nights such a way. Do you understand the logic? They don't sleep at all. Naturally, doing this, the person achieves the altered consciousness and it becomes easier to meditate on the brink of dream. But when a person closes his or her eyes in this state and starts meditation, it's impossible to say whether it's a dream or meditation, maybe past lives or hallucinations, but nevertheless, it's efficient and can help someone. So, it also has a right to life. In accordance with the above mentioned systems, we had to take a little bit from Ganga system, a little bit from Hatha system, and to add Hatha Yoga, because they usually don't like Hatha Yoga in the monasteries. Hatha Yoga is considered to be the beginner level, so only for beginners. They position themselves as advanced yogis who do just meditation. But we are adequate people and understand that it will be unreal for many people without Hatha Yoga. So, we have included morning hatha yoga in the schedule, and all the rest time we alternate dynamics and statics. So it's closer to the system of Mahasiyado. In fact, it is rather efficient. Okay. Do you have any questions or comments to this part? How long is retreat? Where? Here. Our retreat continues for ten days too. I don't comment on what psychologists say. To remember higher realms, you should activate the high chakras. If you have a rough energy, you will be able to remember past lives, but they will be in lower realms. Do you understand logic? Here you can see the classification of chakras. Last time I told you that chakras are the gates to other realms. The realm that you experience depends on what chakra you are now. If a person is eating from morning to night, he will have no subtle experience. He will see the world where everyone is just eating. He will see what he is sick with. It's okay. So, to move to the high chakra and to see more subtle world and to get the experience of subtle world, you need to make efforts. Psychologists are great, but they want to get something for free. But I contend that it's impossible to get something for free. Now, it's not the time when we can get everything very fast and easily. It's necessary to make efforts. And the retreats are very helpful in this case. Sometimes I am asked the question, why does retreat continue for 10 days and no longer? If we don't get enough experience within 10 days, maybe it's better to have, for example, 15 or 20 days, we try to conduct longer retreats and we have the statistics, people can't withstand it. If people can endure and make efforts during 10 days, they start just sleeping since the 11th day. They don't meditate, they just sleep, sleep and sleep. But during 10 days, the awareness of a person can be quite appropriate and he can control himself. I have a question. Can we remember past lives only sitting in Padmasana? Of course not. How many of you can do Padmasana? Probably about five people will raise their hands. And we will sit in Padmasana at least for 15 minutes. There will be only two hands raised. Of course, Padmasana will have a positive impact. But even Sikhasana or Sukhasana, the easy pose, will influence a other wire. The main problem of people on the retreats is in their legs. Everyone faces it during the first three days. People experience great 
rage, discomfort and just horror in their legs. No one beats them, they aren't forced, no one makes them sit by force, but why do they feel so uncomfortable on their soft mats, moreover surrounded by soft pillows on all sides? They usually create something like a pedestal with the pillows, but nevertheless they are sitting on this pedestal like hedgehogs. This may be funny, but there's some sadness in this laughter. Why does this happen? For example, if you try to enter an adequate yoga school in India as a sannyasi or someone else, no one will look at your legs. If you want to develop some way, you should have thought about your legs before, because they are such a concept. You are the only one who created all the problems with your legs, this is the adverse actions you committed. It's connected with your Apana wire. There, on the picture, on the wall you can see the man with the gray ellipse in the lower body. This is the Apana wire that makes the life of the majority people difficult. If a person lives improperly, commits bad deeds, his energy of Apana wire will intensify. There are some people with very flexible legs, the so-called very complex legs and they do one nasty things in their life. They have very strong upon the wire, and it's often said that the upon the wire has full control over such a person. Unfortunately, it dominates all the other energies, and as a consequence, a person has low gloomy consciousness because of a panavir. Most of our contemporaries don't even know what their panavir is. They just live well. The legs may hurt, no problem. They don't pay attention to it. Everyone has problems with legs. They go to the doctor who prescribes pills or something else. However, a panavir is a very big problem for the ashrams. If you have very hard or legend scriptures, when a guru begins to make up some austerities for his student or suggests him do some kind of austerity, probably you've noticed that most often these austerities are quite painful and dramatic, but the student experiences pain and regularly gets over himself. All these austerities or penances, as Christians say, are aimed at working with negative energies, in particular with a part of our it is an important component of yoga. What I am getting at? So, if you have some problems with your legs, you are the one who created this problem. If you leave it as it is and forget about it, thinking, come watch me, it's likely that it will only get worse. Yogis have a different situation. You just need regularly to make efforts to develop yourself. There is nothing complicated in it. You just need to make yourself do yoga a little. It can be done for free because now there is a huge amount of literature and videos. Just find a video and start doing yoga. Who doesn't allow you to do it? But you will agree that someone doesn't allow. Far from all people can afford it. And there is even an explanation for who doesn't allow you to do yoga. As yoga affects their person's karma and energy, there are certain instances which are interested in your bad karma, roughly speaking. They are interested in you not focusing on self-development. They have some benefits parasitizing on you, so they are interested in it. That's why people who go to the retreat often tell that for the first three days they were thinking about how to escape from here. They had strong arguments that everything will be okay if they escape from here. We had an interesting case during one of the retreats. During the retreat, people write notes with the questions on the retreat. And it was written in one note that it was hard for the first five days and a person wanted to escape from here but finally endured it. I said, you have done very well that you have endured it, and if you had run away, you would have met a very hard reality, because you are not just running away, you want to do it because someone pressured you. He made you run away, and he won't leave you alone, because you have shown the weakness, and it will be just hardcore. 
Then one guy raised his hand and asked, may I say one thing? But I said that you should keep silence, you shouldn't talk during the retreat. But he insisted and said that he had been to the retreat a year ago and after three days he also had faced difficulties and ran away. And when he had returned home, he had, he had made all the possible nonsense. He stupidly even had taken a big loan in the bank. So if you run away from the retreat, it will only worsen the situation because certain energies that control you really exist, to my great regret. Okay, what is your question? And what if the problems with legs appear after sitting about an hour and a half? It's great, you may get some experience during an hour and a half. Can it happen that the soul is on the planet for the first time and has no past lives? So the soul can remember nothing, or this soul can remember just the hell. There can be all kinds of things in this world you want. In my time I thought that there can be some borders or frames, but the more I live, the more I realize that there can be all kinds of things, even the things that you can't imagine, so any soul can come to this world. We shouldn't be surprised. Theoretically, there can be even such examples. What is the next question? You said that there should be no problems with legs to remember something good, but if the past lives had been bad, will I see them anywhere regardless of my legs? Theoretically, yes, but you perceived this information in your own way. I spoke not only about legs, I spoke about chakras. If there is a rough energy, the most energy is in your chakras, you will get difficult experience. But nevertheless, to get even the experience of hell is great, believe me. After that, you will live as a law abiding citizen, and everything will be correct in your life. So, it can influence you very much. Recently, one girl has come to the retreat. I even saw her here, and after the retreat she wrote a review on it. So, she wrote about the experience she got. She had some positive experience and some negative experience, but she wanted to share the experience of the low world or hell that she got. She described it as the concentration of problems, illnesses, suffering and other negative things. There is so numerous concentration of problems that it's almost unreal to escape from this horror. Such things really exist. If someone thinks that this is just a religious tale, no problem. Answering your question, if the soul comes here for the first time and has no experience, this soul is unlikely to face yoga. Such souls usually live being just crazy. They would live life to the fullest. They are just out of control. And even if they are said, don't go there, don't do that, they don't care. They will do all the mistakes. Unfortunately, such people can be taught only through the pain and suffering. And there are special institutions controlling such people. So, there is a certain contingent of people on this planet who completely doesn't fit the social norms. They just can't do it for a number of reasons. Probably these are the souls that accumulate their first experience and they are healed through suffering. But again, this system is very perverse. It's impossible to change a person with the help of a prison. He or she won't become better. Unfortunately, the more time he will spend there, the worse he will return after it. If a person has evil inside, no matter how much he you will beat him, 
you will not knock the evil out. You can intimidate him for some time, but as soon he gets rid of the fear, this will happen all over again. The concept knife for knife, a tooth for a tooth, doesn't work. It doesn't change the situation, to my great regret. Okay, friends, do you have any questions? <coughs> so, do you have any other questions? Yes. There are lovers, bad entities, and are there any good entities? I assume that everything can exist in this world. If someone pulls you in one direction, another one must pull you in another direction, otherwise there will be imbalance. The problem is that it's not bad that lovers exist. This is a big misconception. For example, a psychic writes that you'll get rid of lovers forever, it's guaranteed. Theoretically, he can do it, but the question is for how long, because a lover comes according to karma, keep it in mind. If one's guilt is evident, there is such an expression, then lava comes to him. For example, there are Bob and John and one lava. It can come to Bob or John, but it will choose the one who must get requital according to his karma. I'll give you an example. I have a friend who began to do yoga a long time ago. The guy is great, he makes efforts, but does it in a strange way. He has an alcoholic karma, so he is addicted to a drink. It has been continuing for 20 years. A man doesn't drink at all during the year, but once a year he gets drunk so much that during his booze he destroys everything. He is just out of control. He becomes an idiot. Unfortunately, we don't communicate for that reason, because it's unreal to build relationships with him. He will do a nasty thing for you anyway. He has a very strange karma. It was very strange to watch him out of control until we found out a reason. He sold alcohol and made others drunk in past lives. So, in this life, he understands everything but can't control it. He lives in the prison of his addiction and can't have anything in the life because of it. I won't go into details. No words can describe what he does, and he does just crazy things. I have an interesting example. One man worked in a winery. He also was constantly drinking for some years. He told that after the booze, he awoke sitting in Padmasana with horrible pain, but in Padmasana. And it was more than once. I was also surprised when I was told this. To be honest, I don't know why, but it's better for him to give up this business. Yes, he gave up both business and addiction. At a certain stage it was over, but the situation was just surprising. Probably he had both karma of wine merchant and the karma of yogi. And if he participated in this business, in this life, he'll have to face it in his future lives. And he can't get anyway from it. One of my friends told, there is a big liquor enterprise in Moscow region, and there are the managers on this enterprise. Just imagine these managers stole the whole wagons of alcohol from this enterprise. This is double nasty things. Not only alcohol, but also stealing. It's something like a grim mixture. The most interesting thing is that they change the managers and the same thing happens. The wagons are stolen anyway. It's like a system. Yeah. 
Do you have a question? Yes. Is it possible to meditate in Shavasana? Uh, generally, Shavasana appeared for Western people. This is the pose for relaxation, and advanced yogis practically don't use it because of a pranavaya, as those who work with energy know that when you lie down, your pranavaya starts flowing down. So when they rest, they sit in the pose with the legs crossed. Not necessarily in Padmasana, but at least any position with the legs crossed. When Europeans began to arrive in India in 1980s, they were very flexible, but they brought the money. That's why yoga was almost changed just for them. And Yoga Nidra appeared in some or rather in almost all the ashrams. Yoga Nidra is a product that was made for Western people. It was created to help flexible people who come from Europe and America and aren't able to do yoga to get some experience. They lie down in Shavasana and the teacher helps them to relax. Yes, it has a certain therapeutic effect. For someone it's an opportunity even to get some experience. I can't say that it's bad, but again it's like the crutches for people with disabilities, roughly speaking. For example, a man can't walk and he's given the crutches that was called Yoga Nidra. At least it's better than nothing. So, if you can, it's better and not to allow the energy to go down. I'm telling you a major thing in the way normal yogis talk to each other. And for inflexible people, they offer Shavasana nice and relaxing music and even make some coffee. So this is considered normal. Don't be surprised. There are entire schools of yoga and many of their representatives have an addiction to coffee because Krishnamacharya had a passion. He liked drinking coffee. Then it was passed on to his disciples, Angar and Patapkijars. There are two great schools of yoga popular in Russia, Angar Yoga and Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. And the vast majority of Ashtanga Vinyasa practitioners are addicted to coffee. Because when they come to India, they see that there is almost a ritual to drink coffee in the morning, the stronger the better, and then to do yoga. Sorry if I've touched on a sour subject, but there are very many people addicted to coffee. It sounds funny that uh, yogis can't be addicted to coffee, but it's real. What is the question? Could all the saints sit in Padmasana or was it necessary or necessary for them? Do you mean the saints in yoga? Yes, for example, I read that Jesus Christ was connected with yoga somehow as for Mahat and sages of Radhanish, they were vegetarians and prayed a lot. I can't speak for the others. I don't know what they were doing exactly, but I can say that actually they experienced great austerities. I don't know about their legs, but their austerities or penances, as Christians say, were great. Just read the life story of any practitioner or mystic who has made a mark in the history, and you will see that uh, they always put a lot of effort into self-development. I have never met one who lived in the global loved everyone, always over at, and then become a saint. I haven't met that. As soon as people start leading an unbridled way of life, not only holiness, but everything positive, immediately disappears. So, what is the question? I have a question about the Jivatma. Initially, it appeared to gain the experience. It began to divide to get different experience. In theory, this experience should be stored somewhere, because it must remember each life after life. It gains it. As I understood it, only the soul can store the experience. But in theory, Jivatma appeared to gain the experience and began to divide in order to gain the experience. But there is no information about this recorded experience. And where is it recorded? There is such information. You just haven't faced it yet. I'll tell you about it. I can't comment on where Jivatma came from. No one knows it. Some Something is written in the scriptures, but not so deeply. You have a system of chakras and energy channels. This is the hard disk where your experience is recorded. Every person will have an individual experience, but the plants and stones have no chakras and channels. 
The beings have them when they have already evolved, and does a plant have the opportunity to choose? Does it have a personality to decide to grow on one bed and not to grow on, on another one? Or, for example, to go to one kind of soup and not go to another one? A plant pays debts because, in fact, it is used. And it doesn't have the same jivatma as, for example, a mammal has. A mammal has a choice. Go to the right or slightly to the left or slightly to the right. Animals can do some actions. They have a choice, even on the animal level. But this chakra system appears beginning with a level of a person. At least, I read that animals had chakras, but they are not like humans at all. How is the experience of Jivatma recorded and how can we get access to it? You watch it every day because your any channels and chakras accumulate the passions that you have. There is such a term blocked channels. This means whether the energy can come through the channels or not. Or, for example, the chakra of a person is needed to read the experience. What does it mean? For example, a person at the level of the Mothara chakra was constantly angry and violent to others. So, he had the karma constantly to do the violence. And most importantly, he not only did it, but enjoyed doing it. Do you see the difference? There is such a form of violence when you, for example, swatted a mosquito, but you had to do that as it showed aggression. This is your self-defense because the mosquito flew up to you and not vice versa. You don't feel pleasure, but there are people who take pleasure in violence. Then such a person has this experience at the level of the most Heart chakra. All the nasty things that he does are recorded there. In the future life, when he wants to do yoga, he will have very big problems with his body and especially with his legs. It's very difficult for people who have accumulated a lot of negative karma to move forward on the path of yoga. Similarly, all the other passions are recorded in all the chakras. And what's the problem? However, it's not a problem, it's fair. If a person was on the most heart chakra, it will be more difficult for him to move to the heart chakra. In the next life, this person will have a tendency to do bad things. For example, he will be told not to beat anyone, try to communicate peacefully, but if he gets into a certain situation, he won't be able to control himself. He will continue doing nasty things out of habit. Do you understand what I mean? And this is because of the Modhara Chakra. To eliminate the block in the Modhara Chakra and to raise the energy from one level to another, people use austerity. When a person puts himself in uncomfortable conditions, he changes the flow of energy through austerity. So the energy rises higher and then new passions of a person appear. He begins to realize that he can enjoy other things not beating anyone. So the other chakras accumulate the other qualities of a person and store them. That's why there is a concept to cleanse the chakra. If you experience a certain austerity, you get through the experience of a certain chakra. Imagine that such a person was forced to do yoga or maybe was motivated to do yoga. I can't imagine it, but let's assume that he began to do yoga. Theoretically, through the pain and horror that he will experience on the mat, he will avoid the situation when he will suffer from the consequences of his previous actions. This is not a joke. It's real. Why? Because a person who begins to use austerity not only eliminates his karma, but he breaks the entire negative chain of causation. What? Revelations. Yes, according to the revelations of an elite family insider, allegedly there is a group of people who do negative things, reaping the harvest of this karma. This is very dangerous. I can give an example. There is one saying. I had prayed to God and asked him for a bike before I understood how all that worked. Then I stole a bike and began to pray to God for forgiveness. That is joke about the religions. 
Короче, ребята, okay. самое интересное, so, что я вам хочу сказать, is this почему это why все are the past важно, life memory почему это все важно, 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 Suffering, they change the energy flow in their inner world. They change the experience that they had. So they evolve even suffering on the mat. They eliminate the cause of some problems that they may face in the future. Do you have any questions on this part? Okay, that's why in the Vedic culture they take austerity very seriously. Austerity is a tool for change the karma. Even if you have accumulated negative karma, you can overcome it. I'll give you an example from the Vedic culture. There was Balmaki, who was, to put it simply, a racketeer or a brigand. And he and his family lived on the money that he stole from wayfarers. But once he met the sages who were able to explain him clearly that it's not good and he would have some comic consequences. He began to realize all the burden of karma that he made. He killed and robbed many people. He realized what he would experience because the law of karma exists. As he had a huge amount of the negative karma, he made himself practice very hard. He had a cause and a motivation to make efforts in self-improvement, and ultimately he became an outstanding personality. Probably, if he hadn't done all those nasty things, he wouldn't have become such a person. Therefore, if a person has negative karma, we mustn't give up on him and forbid him to do yoga. It's unknown what karma each of us has, and probably your negative karma will force you to make efforts in self-development. So, what is the question? Am I right that karma of ankle, knees and hips correspond to three lower chakras? Yes, there is such an analogy. Does the back hurt when the Vishuddha or Anahata chakra is cleansed? If the energy channel becomes unblocked at the level of the Anahata chakra, you will feel pain in your back behind the chakra. The energy will move through the channel and, to put it mildly, you will not like it. It will hurt. Andre, what are the ways to raise energy from one chakra to another one from your own experience? One of the ways is austerity. Are there any other ways? The most important thing is the limitation of the waste of energy. In order to raise the energy, it's necessary to accumulate it, and in order to accumulate it, it's necessary to impose certain restrictions. For example, a person is constantly on the level of Sathistana Chakra, so he or she feels lost. There are some people who regularly need to have sex. If such a person doesn't have sex, he or she feels uncomfortable and is ready to come up to anyone because this person reads modern magazines where it's written that Regular sex is very important if you don't have sex twice a week, you'll get sick with a terrible disease. A lot of nonsense on this topic is written in the magazines, so a person becomes addicted to it. In order to raise the energy up to the Manipur chakra, for example, at least he or she will have to do a penance and to stop wasting this energy. The energy will never rise if he continues uh, to satisfy his uh, visual passions. In ancient times, they drew their followers. Scheme. It was like a bottle in the picture you see, but they drew the amphora. So, there are five holes in amphora in accordance with five chakras. The sixth and the seventh chakras, the Rizajna and Sahasrara chakras, are considered to be positive. And even if you spend the energy through them, it's spent for good, because these are creative chakras, to some extent. The five lower chakras are considered to be less sensible. 
Solid energy is spent through them irrationally, and the broad rationality is the key broad to some extent. If you spend the energy through the Mothara chakra, you will spend one pound of the energy per one second. If you face anger, you understand that it's something like volcano, something like uncontrollable explosion. And what you feel after this gush of anger? A normal person feels just exhausted. The vampire feels the opposite thing. Such people with qualities of vampires first show their anger in order to get the energy of their opponent afterwards. So, they cause someone's anger and then get his energy. These people will feel very good after that. But they usually don't understand that they get the life energy of another person. This is primitive vampirism. So, here, one pound of energy per second is spent. At the level of the Satisana chakra, you can spend a pound of energy during five hours of healthy animal sex. Oh, pardon the expression. So, it was one second there, and it's five hours here. Do you feel the difference? And at the level of the Manipura Chakra, you can spend the same amount of energy during five years, eating some tasty things and enjoying them in every possible way. If you spend this pound of energy through the Anahata Chakra, you will learn to love the whole world, you will open your chakra, love everyone and see the sun rises with love during all your life. You will spend this pound of energy effectively in such a way. If you are used to spend the energy through the Vishuddha Chakra as the manager working out some strategies or subterfuges, you spend this pound of energy during several lives. Even if this manager deceives someone or sets someone up with the help of his strategy, it's like a creative activity for him. So, the higher the chakra, the more rationally this energy is spent. And and the energy is actually one and the same. Do you have a question? Yes. Does the energy rise gradually through the chakras? Or can it be accumulated in any chakra? Yes, of course, it can be accumulated in any chakra. So, depending on what you did in the past life, you can get the energy from your past life. It's hard to believe it, but it's true. For example, in the past life you built a good house and left it to someone to live in it. The man who lives in this house thanks you. It's a very approximate example, but even living this life you can even feel gratitude that you created in your past lives, it will overtake you anyway. So, depending on how you have lived your past lives, the energy will appear in corresponding chakras. It will not, I will not go into the details what you need to do to accumulate the energy in every chakra, but it will be very difficult for you to believe in it. And I wouldn't like you to start doing something like that. that uh, will be very bad karma. But theoretically, you can get and uh, feel the energy in a certain chakra. For example, one good woman cooked very well and fed a lot of people and they thanked her a lot. At the level of the Manipura chakra, she will constantly feel the inflow of energy. What do you think? How will this energy influence her in this life? Yes, she will want to eat. She will love to eat. She will come up to the mirror and start crying, then go back to the kitchen and hold the refrigerator, and then she will come up to the mirror and start crying again, and so on. That's how they live. It happens because she cooked for the wrong people. Now I'll explain you what I mean. If a woman cooks for a person who just wastes away his life, she gets the same life wasting karma. In very few cases, a woman can cook for a man who moves on the path of self development. The more this man reaches, the more this woman will also reach, even through cooking. That's why it's so important what husband or wife you will have and how he or she will perform his or her duties. 
Это очень круто, если great, ты if you can help someone who evolves. сможешь помочь человеку, It's great both for your present and for your future lives. All this is recorded at the level of energy. So any chakra can manifest. And if you feel a certain dependence, because if there is a lot of energy, a dependence surely occurs. Then you need to do yoga. When you receive raw energy, you can convert it by means of strategies and practices. I'll give you an example. Today we did yoga. There are usually two categories of people practicing Hatha Yoga. The first one is those for whom it's really hot, it's an austerity. When they end the practice, they feel a relief because the austerity is over. But there is also another category of people who have already passed through their austerities and practicing yoga, they can get the experience of qualitative change of energy. After the practice, these people can feel a new state of energy. Please raise your hands if you feel the, energy, the change of energy after Hatha Yoga class. So, you can see it really works. This is not hallucinations. If you have the ability to change the energy, you will begin to feel it. And what energy do you change? You change the energy that could come to you and make you do all the sorts of things that are not always good. Doing Hatha Yoga, you change the quality of energy and as a result, you change your behavior patterns. That's the miracle of austerity and the most of people feel the austerity on the mat. No one feels on the mat. When you lay out mat and imagine what you feel, you can even shed a tear. And then you begin to make efforts and sweat. But there is nothing you can do about it. That's the reality. If you don't make efforts and sweat, you, it would get worse. Do you have a question? Does it happen only for the first year? It's different for everyone. For someone, a month is enough. For example, one girl came to our yoga teacher training course in September. I, I saw her smokanasana. It was like a triangle. I always evaluate the level of development of our physicians teachers who come to us. And I was so glad to see that after five months, she almost did smokanasana. Only five centimeters remained. And if you don't know, smokanasana is a side split, the most terrible thing that could be in your life. When a person begins to do Smokanasana in five months, it's just great because that shows she really makes efforts and there are people who do yoga from time to time. When they can't do something, they stop. The main thing is to make efforts, so for one person it can be a year, for another one it can take a month. Children do the split easily and then lose this ability with age. How can this be explained? It's because of energy. They can do it and then lose this ability, but if they train regularly and live righteously, they will not lose this ability. A righteous life is the key word because all the problems of the body are caused by unrighteous life. There are people who don't do yoga. But they don't have many problems with the body. And there's another example. Let's say there's a ballerina. And, for example, she is just an immoral person. Of course, it's a joke. Not all of them are like this. I speak about one of my friends. Her legs can bet in all the directions because she experienced hell through the whole childhood. The system of training of athletes or belly dancers means hell every day. Parents take their children to the belly school to make them experience just hell, hell and hell. So, the consequences are quite obvious. So, friends, have you remembered the theory? It's very important to realize how the energy is wasted. I advise you to hand the similar picture with the scheme of chakras and the ways of wasting energy on the refrigerator at home in front of the door, for example. And before going outside, look at it and remember that if, for example, you yell at your neighbor mob for his loud music very much, you will waste some energy. And in this case, you will tactfully tell Bob that it's, it's illegal to turn on loud music after 11 p.m. And then you will move on calmly. So treat others as you would be treated yourself. If you don't want to live like that crazy man, 
in your future lives, don't do it. Yes? You say if we waste energy through this or that chakra, it doesn't rise above. Why did all the teachers like Buddha and Jesus Christ teach to give love to others? So there's a contradiction. <laughs> did they say about love to you personally? It's written in the scriptures. For example, Buddha said it. It's not written. The sutras believe me. So we should have neutral attitude to everything. Yes, equable and calm attitude is an adequate quality. If you love someone today, then you hate him or her tomorrow according to the law of karma. So you'll have to get the opposite alternative. And are compassion and love the same thing? No, they are absolutely different things. Actually, the teachers say about compassion, but as for love, I can't command in Christianity, but as for Buddhism, I'm well versed in Sutras to some extent. So there's not a word about love there. It's 100%. As for compassion, Buddha really says about it because compassion is higher. And uh, what about for sublime states? It's said about love there. There can be certain stages when a person is taught to develop love. love. Imagine that a person is at the level of the lower chakras. He is always trapping himself and overeating, having a lot of sex, or getting angry easily. Love is out of the question for such people. There are special practices for them. They are taught to love, but not in a primitive way when people just say, Oh, I love you, honey bunny. This will end fast. It means to love in a broader sense. So, to love the whole humanity, all people, and to develop the unhealthy chakra to get out from the lower chakras. It's just two, but if you get a little caught up or in it, you can become a narrow minded person. There are people who talk about hardness, encourage to love the whole world, and warm the whole cold space with the unhealthy chakra. It doesn't mean anything. They are just strange people, but it's not relevant to yoga at all. I don't want to criticize, so let's just stop talking about this. But it's narrow-minded. It's very tragic to develop the Anahata Chakra. I know a lot of examples of very hearty people who were broken very much by the life. They can't pass a lot of life lessons because of their hardness, as they are too sensitive. So they perceive their reality through the senses, but uh, it's impossible that it will be always summer. If it is summer now, wait for a winter, it will come surely, and in winter these people become just inadequate. In winter, I mean in difficult times. The sensitive people behave inadequately. Many of them often get bad karma. So you should treat the reality equally. If there is something to rejoice, try to rejoice equally. And if you have a grief, grieve equally. That's okay. Moreover, the biggest problem is not only in what you experience, but also what you do to others during this challenge. Probably you have met the people who suffered and did bad things to others because of suffering. Do you get what I mean? If you develop your Anahata Chakra, you will suffer very much. Jealousy and affection that occur in the family are just hell. It's the whole layer of energy. People develop their Anahata Chakra maximally first, but if the partner or of such a person does something wrong, the response of this person will be quite inadequate. Okay, we have gone too far. So, if you need to raise the level to the Anahata Chakra, love can help you, as Kaida told you about the four sublime states. They develop love at the first stage. It's the most primitive sense of what the man needs to develop. At the next stage, they develop compassion. Try to emphasize and understand the problems of others, not to be selfish, but try to develop the quality of empathy with other people. The third stage means sympathetic joy or being happy for others. Probably not everyone understands the term sympathetic joy. One man told me 
What are the Russians of explanation of sympathetic joy? And how do you understand the term sympathetic joy? To rejoice together with someone, to be glad for someone's success. So, you just will be glad for him, and is that all? We also praise him for that. Okay, friends, in uh, yoga everything is uh, logical and real. That's why the term sympathetic joy is explained in the following way. There is such a concept as envy. For example, one has some qualities of the soul and you can envy him. But envy is a bad quality. And what you can get when instead of envy you feel sympathetic joy. Yes, you are right. You will cultivate the same quality. For example, if you feel sympathetic joy for some good qualities of an outstanding person, you will nurture the same qualities. And then, sooner or later, you will also have these qualities. And what is the fourth state? It's equanimity. Katya, could you explain what equanimity means? Equanimity means when you perceive all the challenges equally as a result of your karma. If something negative happens, you accept it and make conclusions. If something positive happens, you also accept it equally, not given into the emotional outburst. Do you agree with it? In fact, it's something like indifference, but actually indifference means calmness. No, it's about another thing. It's the main mistake. The issue isn't about indifference or unemotionality. In other words, it can be explained as acceptance. Well, you say it from a theoretical point of view. And uh, now I'll tell you it from a practical standpoint. When a person begins to practice yoga or self-development or starts a spiritual path, at the first stage he faces hardship or tests. Most often people who live near him will test his fortitude, change him and create certain problems. The fourth quality means to treat everything that comes to you calmly because the test will surely come to anyone. And this is the model of survival of an adequate practitioner. If the test has come to you as your practitioner, for example, someone is angry with you and you have a habitual behavior pattern, someone yelled at me, then I'll yell in response. There will be no development. That's why if someone yelled at you, it's better to keep silent, endure it and treat it equally, not getting involved in the process. Only then you will be able to overcome it. It's like a test or a lesson that you have to pass properly. It's like an exam that you have to pass. So, we should understand it's not hardship but a test. Yes, if you can, but sometimes the tests are so cool that you will understand it after you have already quarreled. How can we call this fourth quality? Maybe impartiality. Yes, it's impartiality. Impartiality to the negative events that you face, not getting involved in the process because you face it anyway. The path of yoga is difficult not only at physical level. If you try to stay on this path, you will have both emotional and energy tests necessarily. There will be different periods. We can compare it with the following. Even if you got into some kind of vehicle and you know that it goes in the right direction, it doesn't mean that it will be easy to stay in this vehicle. As it's written in the scriptures, there is a boat that can carry you across the river to another bank, but a storm may begin in the middle of the river. And the way you will behave during the storm depends on your personal qualities. If you have accumulated a lot of negative, your own karma will throw you out of the boat. That's why you have to prepare systematically, develop gradually and to endure a lot. Do you have a question? Yes? What do you think about wishing everyone happiness? Why not? It's positive.
What you do to earn this will be done to you too. The only question is what kind of happiness you wish and what you will get. Probably you will get such happiness that it will be very difficult to get rid of it. Happiness is different. I'll give you an example. There is a hedgehog that steals apples in the garden and you wish it happiness. And for it just stealing apples is happiness. It has such kind of happiness. So you wish that and it continues to steal. But there is a chance that sooner or later the gardener will notice this hedgehog and it wouldn't feel well. So, if you wish something, you should wish a person only the things that will promote his or her development, but not the satisfaction of uh, primitive passions. Well, for example, you wish happiness to the person who wants to have a big, happy family in the Kali Yuga in a country where people are used as batteries. So, he will have a big, close niche family, the children will be brought up by social institutions and will be raised as consumers. In the end, everyone will have problems because the parent is responsible for what will come out of his child. Sometimes parents say that their child was taught something bad in the university, and then he did some bad things. But truly speaking, it's the fault of the parents, because they didn't pay enough attention to the child. It's their problem, because it's their child whom they raised. Excuse me for such details, but it's a fact. So, if you wish someone happiness, you must realize to what and who you wish. So, we should everyone happiness isn't correct. It's just not like Yogi's job. I have just explained that we understand happiness in different ways. If this primitive happiness leads to grief, it's better not to wish it. It's better to wish for development or enlightenment. It's always good when you wish enlightenment. There's a notion of delusion, and most often people make mistakes, mistakes because of it. Enlightenment means the absence of delusion. It's like a light when one sees possible mistakes and doesn't make them. It's blessing. Это, это свет, когда человек видит ошибки и не совершает их. Это вот благо. Есть Do you have any other questions? Да. Yes. For example, we raise the energy to give it to other people, to help them get out of the lower chakras. So, the exchange of energy happens during communication. How does it affect the chakras or maybe the energy channels? You shouldn't worry about it. If you think you can control this process, I assure you that's not so. For example, if you do yoga or don't do yoga, you form a certain vector of your development. Hypothetically, there can be such a vector that leads to degradation gradually. And from the point of view of such a person who degrades, his life is pretty good. For example, the slaves are working for him. He has so-called room happiness that is quite understandable for him. He doesn't even understand that there are some problems. For him everything is okay. He is happy in his own way. But hypothetically, this person may have another vector of development. And it will be different because there will be some people who, as you say, will bring the karma. Maybe you will exchange the energy with someone you don't want, but it's impossible. You will face people who will create some problems for you. And these people will be the runs of the ledger of your development and growth. And the person who degrades won't face such people. He will be allowed to waste all his energy and will have to work out his karma on a maximum later. Probably you are surprised, but it's real. The life of people who accumulate bad karma is better than the life of people who are engaged in self-development. The scandals are allowed to live very happily on this planet because it's necessary. Their energy is taken in this way. So, because when a person lives in the so-called happiness, he spends purpose. The person who overcomes obstacles accumulate tapas, and the other one only spends it. I'll give you an example from the Mahabharata, the 16th book. There is the episode when Yudhishkira goes to the heavens, and the first person 
he sees there is the Rajana, the devil incarnate. So the world view of Yudhishthira is just falling apart. This monster Rajana lived as a parasite all his life. He is almost the devil incarnate who was doing a lot of nasty things. Yudhishthira doesn't understand why he is in the heavens. At the same time, when Yudhishthira begins to look for his brothers who led a righteous life, he finds them in hell. So he doesn't understand anything. Everything is just falling apart. There is a contradiction everywhere. But the God Indra explained to him that actually there is no contradiction. Everything is logical. For the righteous man, negative karma manifests as a test at first. They have to endure it, and on the contrary, the sins are given a lot of pleasures to make them waste all their energy. Maybe it's not obvious and clear for you. For example, a person has the karma of hell, so he is time to go to hell, but he has some accumulated tapas. While he has these tapas, he can't go to hell because tapas will support him like a bobber. Do you understand the word tapas? No? So, tapas is the universal energy of yogis. This is when you suffer austerity or, for example, when a scoundrel helps a holy man and they form the energy channel. The holy man will give some amount of tapas to him automatically, so this scoundrel will have a chance to evolve a little bit because while he has a little tapas, he won't go to hell, he won't be formatted completely and uh, will not have to start from scratch. Tapas will like a bobber support uh, a person on his path. So Tapas, so people who degrade, it is usually exchanged for some sensual or material pleasures, such as cars, apartments, lots of sex, plenty of alcohol and food. Thus, they waste everything that they have accumulated in the past as universal energy. Is the same thing about donations? What donations? For example, now businessmen donate to the churches. It depends on what charge they donate. What is the question? As for Duryodhana, everything is clear. But why were the Pandavas sent to purgatory? Why were they formatted? They weren't formatted completely because hell can be different. There is one where it's just hardcore, and there is the other one where they are cleansed a little bit, not up to the Jivatham. In the character, you can find the description of the qualities each of the Pandavas had. I wouldn't like to repeat it, but I can tell you. Uh, for example, Draupadi won, went to hell because uh, she loved Arjuna most of all her five husbands. Pima went to hell because he had very strong passion for food. That was his flaw. He ate without controlling himself. Nakula and Sahadeva went to hell because Nakula thought he was the most handsome, while Sahadeva thought he was the smartest. Arjuna went to hell because he had promised to finish the battle in one day and didn't keep his promise allegedly. But uh, I didn't want to tell that first because it's all related. Actually, there were some problems in the energy and channels. Now I will explain why they went to hell. Arjuna, Masen, Nakula, Sahadeva, Draupadi, Tishkira were not quite people. They were the avatars that were incarnated on this planet to implement certain plans. And they were a part of the personality of each deity that manifested them. Yudhish hero was a part of the personality of the god Yama. And Yudhish hero couldn't connect with Yama because he had certain flaws. However, it isn't a good example. Allegedly, Yudhish hero had already gone to the heaven and could do it. And, for example, Arjuna couldn't connect it with Indra because Arjuna had some flaws. Draupadi couldn't connect with Agni because she also had some flaws. So they had to go through this purgatory to get rid of the flaws and connect with gods. Okay, actually our lecture was about retreat and the fact that theoretically it's possible to remember the past lives if you make efforts. If one hopes that enjoying tasty food, pleasant sleep, driving the car, sitting in the office and controlling his lips, everything will be well, it will not, unless you make efforts to self-development. It is impossible, it, it is important to do it every day, at least a little bit, and then you 
you will have development. And there is another important point. Why is it important to know past lives and try to understand it? The thing is, you may stay on the path of yoga only for a short period. If you don't have the validation of this path, if you don't gain the experience of validation of the path, you will leave it. This will be a constant battle because everything around will oppose you. You will encourage people to become vegetarians, but 99% of them will reply that all the vegetarians are just frail and weak and will also name different reasons and they will be right in their own way. But if you can overcome it, you will get an important experience that your opponents won't get. If you don't gain your own experience in yoga, any scriptures will disappear in front of you. So, you won't be able to stay on the path of yoga for a long time. There is an explanation that every person who encountered yoga in the past lives is given the opportunity to encounter yoga again, but it's given not for a long time. If you manage to gain a foothold on the path, you will continue to develop. If you don't manage, you will, as everybody leaves, because no one will go easy on you. And you made a tremendous amount of efforts in the past to be here to listen to this lecture, not to work and do yoga. Getting to the path of yoga is an incredible casting. I don't advertise yoga, I am telling it as it is. So, you should appreciate that you just have the opportunity to practice yoga in this life. I advise you to try to confirm on your own experience that yoga isn't nonsense. The scriptures say adequate, appropriate things, but not just philosophical fiction and religious stuff. Otherwise, you will lose and leave this path. Do you have any questions? Yes, please. Is it possible to do yoga singly at home? Yes, of course. It's not only possible, but it's even necessary. In fact, yoga practice is an individual process. The problem is that most people can't do it. They need a mentor who would brought them, pull them periodically and exchange energy with them. Moreover, if you start doing yoga, you need a circle of friends or associates with whom you can communicate. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. You won't manage to do it, but actually you should do yoga on your own. And if you read the scriptures, you find out that collective practice is only for those who can't move on their own. The same applies to retreats. You can do it on your own too. The only question is if you'll be able to make yourself do it alone, and I know a lot of precedents. That's why a group of associates is necessary on the first stage for the first years. And then there are two ways. Either you'll practice on your own, or you'll realize that you've got some knowledge in this life and you can share it. So, you'll understand that it's best to become a teacher. When you become a teacher, everything will change because the teacher will have a new team and become a support for someone else. Then he will have new lessons. You will have to endure very much. However, you will see the result. People around you will develop. And then it becomes easy to endure. If you see people around you developing, believe me, you will endure everything because you will see how it works. For example, a person lived and degraded, he drank and smoked, and when he began to do yoga, he began to live adequately. And it's also better for the society. For example, there's a person who degrades and destroys the society. Why does he do it? The person who doesn't control himself always causes problems. And a person who controls himself lives more harmoniously. If you see such examples, even few people, you will make yourself endure anything because you will see the result. What is your question? When a person has a curvature of the spine, for example, can the cause of it be compared with the cause of problems in the legs? Yes, at a certain level. There is specific energy there. In Ayurveda, you can even find a description of the tendencies different kinds of courageous can have. But this is not a problem. You can do yoga anyway. Actually, a lot of people begin to do yoga just because of spine problems. Is something accumulated there? Yes, and a person may have 
It's not only because of himself. Let's say a person has a problem with the heart chakra and therefore akuracha. This man may say that it's not his fault. Actually, it can be not his fault. But, for example, his mom or grandma loves him so much that she has killed his inner world. There are such examples. Some one of the family may get sick just because of the family has a strange world view. Therefore, it's best to practice yoga for all members of the family. Okay, our time is over, and your question will be the last one for today. I'd like to ask you about the practices. Could you describe how exactly you hold the retreat? Yes, of course, I can tell you. We begin at half past five in the morning with the meditation that continues for two hours. We concentrate on certain eternal processes. Then we have Hatha Yoga class. It continues about two hours, but it's optional. If you want, you can do it. After it, we have breakfast and then a walk. We recommend everyone to walk after breakfast necessarily, because if you sit or sleep, you won't digest food fast. So, you will not be able able to meditate. That's why you need to walk to process the energy better. Then we have pranayama. It continues about two hours in the hall and then an hour outside under the trees. There is special practice. One sits under the tree and begins to practice there. Then we have one hour of concentration on the object. So, we develop the ability to concentrate on an object. It's no matter what object you choose. It may be even the trick on the tree. The main thing is that you will be concentrating on this object continuously. Thus, you increase the ability of the mind not to get distracted, but concentrate on one thing. Then we have one hour of reading or relaxing. Then there's a dinner. After it, we go for a walk again. It continues for one hour or an hour and a half. I say an hour, one hour and an hour and a half, because one hour is dedicated for breakfast and dinner. But everyone is eating about for half an hour, so we have one hour and a half to go for a walk. Then we practice the mantra OM for one hour, and uh, all this time we try not to talk except chanting OM, because its vibrations helps many people to eliminate some problems in their inner world. Then we have bedtime routine and shavasana. Next morning everything is the same, and we practice so all the 10 days. And what about sleeping? <laughs> of course, the participants sleep. It's not like in the system of Mahasi Sayado. They sleep for eight hours, unfortunately. And uh, your question will be the last one. Sometimes people ask, when you started doing yoga, how should we answer this question? What starting point should we choose? For example, I began to do full front split at the age of seven. So, I can say I began to do yoga at the age of seven. What is the criterion? When my clients ask me this question, I don't do know how I should answer it. You can ask them a leading question. What do you mean by yoga? If you mean asanas, I began to do it at the age of seven. As for yoga, I do it from birth. The strategies began just from the moment I was born. That's true, because actually, the whole life is yoga. Moreover, you may be surprised, but this world is created for the souls that are engaged in self development. It's hard uh, to believe it, but it's true. However, you can see completely different things exteriorly, but you will always see the alternative exteriorly. But in fact, in the so-called space registry, our planet, that is called the world Sahar, is considered to be an ideal place for self-development because good and evil are in equal parts. So, you can make a choice. If there were more suffering, you wouldn't be able to develop. You would only suffer. If there were more joy, there would be no self-improvement too. Therefore, this world is a golden mean. And what do you mean when you ask people how long they do yoga? I never ask it. For me, it's no matter how long ago you began to do yoga in this life. But I heard uh, in one of your lectures you asked it. 
Yes, you are right. Probably we discussed pranayama as the next step after asanas. I asked it for statistics to realize what average level the audience has and what I should tell them. If I tell something difficult, they won't understand. If I tell something easy, it won't be interesting. So it's necessary to realize how many people will understand the lecture. But actually, it's no matter how many years you practice yoga. What matters is the experience of your soul, how much you practiced in the past lives. It often happens when a person has recently begun to practice, but he understands many things so clearly that people can learn much from him. Therefore, if a person measures against someone, proudly saying, I've been already doing yoga for 20 years, it doesn't mean anything. Most often they mean hatha yoga. You can do asanas even for 300 years, but do you think it will affect your development? Of course, but it will indirectly affect it. Moreover, it may also affect in another direction. It's important what experience you have. Many people think that if you want to be a yoga teacher, you must have stretching. This is an illusion. In fact, stretching is secondary. The qualities of the soul, the experience, and the knowledge which the person will give are much more important. Teaching asanas is half the battle. What matters is how you communicate with people, how you answer the questions, and what you'll tell them. This is very important. And that is what is called yoga. In fact, yoga is alive, but not asanas. Asanas are a small part. Okay, friends, it's time to end the lecture. I'm very glad that you have come here. Probably we'll meet again, maybe not in this life, but in the future. One, please, continue self-developing. Don't let things slide, because it's very easy to degrade, and then you'll have to make much more efforts. Thank <laughs> you.